you use everything you do, you start creating all of your, your content or creating your internal processes, and then as soon as you have that data, you correct. On a small level, mm -hmm. like you're in a bigger organization, mm -hmm. we're a small organization, Yeah. but with the open floor plans that we have here, there's so many distractions that come up and into play. Yeah. And in theory, we, we did this because we thought everyone would be more collaborative, everyone would work together, it'd be right. quicker, information would go across the room. Yeah. But now we're starting to see the productivity just on our level is coming down because of distractions, Yeah. because of different people it actually transfers culture too right so some people listen to podcasts and everyone listens to podcasts then it kind of always flows yeah. so what have you seen with that in organization so far and how do you feel about that topic because it's going to counter a lot of that new conventional theory that people are saying yeah that isn't necessarily working out the way everyone thought it was going to yeah, so, you know, I've had a lot of similar um, experiences to kind of what you what you just talked about. Um, our office, you know, at, the only people that have an actual office with a door is the partners. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is wide open. You know, there's, there's no private kind of area. So you hear everybody's conversations. Mm -hmm. They're on a call with a client. You know, you hear everything. Um, somebody's eating at their desk. Like, you hear that all. And it's these little kind of um, noises and sounds that I, I, they bother me, you mm -hmm. know, and yeah. I find I'm not, you know, as productive as, uh, as I could be. I get distracted, you know, by other people. I see somebody, I mm -hmm. hear somebody having a fun conversation. I want to join that conversation, right? Yeah. Um, so I find that I am now working maybe not traditional hours. I'm working on the weekend, mm -hmm. you know, coming into the office when people aren't there so that I can actually get work done. Uh, so it's definitely changing, I think, the way people work. Um, it's changing how much people kind of get done in a day. Uh, and yeah, I think it's kind of go about going against that research in terms of the collaboration and the productivity. Well, I think I think yeah. the collaboration is there. I yeah. think the discussions and like the team bonding and that aspect of everyone getting yeah. to know each other is there. We see it here, but like, yeah. like I said, someone opens a bag of chips or is yeah. eating lunch or does something at their desk and everyone kind of turns their head yeah. and it stops productivity and it's yes. tracked. So I'm not sure where it's going to go. I, I yeah. did talk about it in an episode earlier yeah. where I basically said that I, I felt like as things get more virtual, yeah. one day there'll be virtual offices, one day there'll be different ways to do this. Yeah. You still can't replace face-to-face -face interaction yeah. at this point in time. So. I just think that that open floor plan concept will still exist, but yeah. it's going to be more. You're gonna have you're gonna have slightly more barriers. It's yeah. not just wide open. You're yeah. gonna have you're gonna have barriers. Yeah. Um, otherwise, for the open concept to work, you have to allow pure freedom. Yeah. So you have to allow working at any time in a coffee shop, coming up, going down, sitting in the bean bags in the corner. Yeah. Sure, but you can embrace it halfway. It's either yeah. all of it or none of it, which for a lot of companies is going to be tough to swallow. Yeah from a change yeah. perspective. Yeah. Because it's absolutely. not the way it's always been done. Yeah, and I think then that kind of ties into, you know, even the culture piece. Like you look at somewhere like Google, mm -hmm. right? Like the whole concept of kind of this open space, people kind of working in non-traditional environments really works kind of for an organization like that because that's embedded into kind of who they are as an organization, mm -hmm. right? But for somewhere like, you know, a kind of public accounting firm, mm -hmm. where I work is, you know, you still need that privacy. Right, you still need some of those things, so it's not maybe necessarily as aligned to kind of the culture of the organization. Yeah. Right, and I think that drives kind of why you see some of that difference in how it works and kind of maybe where it doesn't work. The one, well, and now that we're rolling, I'll, I'll tell Q he's not here right now, but yeah. he's going to sound the sound. We're okay. going to get started. Okay. I'm with Brianna today. Um, she's with one of the big four firms in change management, digital change management. And we deal with this all the time on the digital side when we're dealing with social media with, with clients. And across the board, people don't, organizations have a tough time changing. So just talk about your experience so far a little bit 
about how you've approached that and how you're putting forward these ERP systems and these digital systems to change organizations that fundamentally are large and have a lot of red tape and a lot of hierarchy. And it's tough to make those changes. Yeah, yeah, it, it's really tough to make those changes. And, you know, and I, I think the approach and the strategies that you would take really do vary depending on kind of the industry um, that you're working with, the company, and kind of the people that you're working with, right? Yeah, everyone's different. Yes, exactly. Everybody's different. And you really do have to kind of tailor your approach um, to to kind of meet those differences. So it's it's really important to understand, you know, first off, kind of what that organization is, is like, right? Mm-hmm. What is their culture? How do they kind of perform you know, their job, what does that look like across the organization holistically? You know, if they're going to implement kind of a new type of ERP software, what are those change impacts, you know, across the processes, you know, for the individual people? And then kind of um, looking at the different strategies to kind of um, approach those change impacts. So a lot of that's going to be around, you know, really having that open communication, right? Um, including those employees that are going to be impacted in the conversation Mm -hmm. so that they um, their kind of opinions are being heard right they know that they actually have a voice to kind of bring to the table and the change isn't necessarily a kind of you have to do this regardless of what you think Um, you know having really uh, kind of tailored training sessions you know to those particular areas um, giving them the types of tools to kind of support them through those changes. Those kind of that's at a high level, kind of the approach that um, within change management you would want to take, We're related to digital transformations. Hey Q, how are you doing? Q made it here, so now we don't have to worry about the camera stuff. The for myself, what mm-hmm. I was saying, I was telling you earlier that like we work with small, medium, large organizations up mm-hmm. to a couple hundred employees. And one of the hardest parts for us is almost every single person has a different idea of what that ERP system is going to do. Mm -hmm. So aligning leadership, aligning the teams is such a huge component of a rebranding process that people don't typically put into that conversation. They just think you're coming in with the toolbox, the toolbox just to put the ERP system in place or put the rebrand in place. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden when you do that, it just all explodes because everyone's using different pieces of it in different ways. Yes. So finding a way to implement that change, whatever it is, in any organization, but align everybody with that open communication, whatever style of change management that you put in place, so that you aren't oscillating, as we say, or going back to what it was before. Yeah. Now, the hard parts that we find when we get into that larger company size, 200-ish people or more, and you're dealing with organizations bigger than that, but is is there's so many levels of red tape there's so much compliance that we're worried about just to get a social post out that you burn so many resources yeah. that any change costs a lot of money when in some cases if you can align you can really streamline that process yeah so with the organizations bigger than that 200 person mark mm-hmm. in your experience so far why why is it so hard to align or is it just there's so many people to get on board that yeah I think it comes down to you know the number of people that you know you do have to kind of get on board Um, it also comes down to kind of people kind of saying well I've done it this way for this number of years so that's just the way that it kind of should be done you know people really and it worked for this many years exactly yeah I think that's the one thing that people always say to us and it's kind of like a warning bell for me it's like I've done it this way for 50 years and it worked for all 50 years yeah and it just it, it it's almost like a barrier that you have to break through absolutely yeah you know and, and i think there's a lot there's a lot of opportunity to really kind of help empower people to start thinking more innovatively right you know a lot of traditional processes are a little bit more kind of data entry um a little more task kind of based mm-hmm. and with like these large-scale digital transformations you're seeing that push to kind of have your employees be empowered to be more innovative and think more, you know, into the future. What could this be? What does this look like? Right? So you're trying to get people's buy-in, but you're also trying to get people to start thinking differently. You know, so I think there's almost like two levels to how you're trying to get people to change and kind of move forward. And I think that's why people are seeing a lot of struggles getting people to that place. 
And so I think kind of going back to what you were saying earlier about really clearly identifying what that future vision is. You know, mm -hmm. what does the business kind of want to be achieving? Where do they want to be going? And really bringing kind of their employees into that conversation kind of helps to get people thinking in the right direction, right? Whether that's, you know, very customer-based type thinking. There's a whole concept of journey mapping that's out there, mm -hmm. you know, right now, especially kind of within the consulting world kind of seeing what is the journey that your customer is taking? How can we make that better, yeah. right? So if you can bring your employees into that type of conversation and say, hey, we can make the customer's um, experience better by doing these types of things, you know, that could get your employees on board a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So having some of those conversations, I think, helps kind of get people on board a little bit more, but... Yeah, and yeah. I think it's, for, again, I think it's a combination of aligning everyone, bringing them into the conversation, but yeah. also a lot of change in any organization is about the individual people as well. It's mm -hmm. not just always about the organization, it's about each individual person as well mm -hmm. and aligning to their goals. Yeah. So finding a, a, that balance in any company that we work with, any company that you're trying to implement change into at whatever level. Mm -hmm. It's about finding the balance of every individual person with the company, with the customers, everything, and aligning it to those core values, which essentially is why we get so excited and go to work every day, yeah. um, to present what we're offering out into the world, how we're changing the world. Yeah. I guess that was super high level, but yes. um, yeah, I, I think that that's, that's sometimes the hardest part. All right, Q, how'd I do? Did I set up the camera right? All right, we can let Danny go behind the, the camera if she wants to go to the room. We, uh, filming this in the morning, this is this has been an interesting one. We usually do them in the afternoon, oh, so everyone, you? yeah, so okay. this is, go ahead, Danny. I just wasn't sure I could get by with a yeah. the camera. Go ahead, Carl, <laughs> Natasha. Morning, Carl. <laughs> Don't worry, Natasha. We're, we'll pause for a second. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so to take that further, mm -hmm. now, talk about ERPs, because I think a lot of people don't, I think a lot of people still don't know what that, that ERP does for yeah. them, right? So a lot of people now put in the <laughs> CRM, they'll, they'll kind of keep track of their clients. Maybe they have that customer journey where they know the process of how they're going through that journey and then into the digital space, into the marketing space, how they get into that funnel and how we're utilizing all that information. Yeah. But ERPs on a, on a large level are more than that. It's about tying everything in the organization together. Yeah. So talk about that and some of those challenges when you're literally going to the entire organization. All of the standard operating procedures, everything they do, yes. and mashing it together into one software yeah yeah so it's really looking at kind of that enterprise level so kind of I guess traditionally um, within an organization kind of each department would maybe have their own kind of standalone system and then they have to do kind of a lot of offline work to kind of bring that all together and so what these ERP systems are doing are kind of removing those standalone systems and kind of bringing everything into one system and uh, so when you are kind of, you're a project manager, for instance, and you need to order materials for a project, they can kind of take control in the system and actually put those uh, materials together in a requisition and they click a button, sends it on to the purchasing yeah. department, right? And then from there, kind of then it flows into finance. So it's a little bit more of that automation <clears throat> and I think a little bit more um, data quality you know, mm -hmm. data consistency. And it removes that offline stuff that used to drain resources. Yes. Right? So when you were spending yeah. that extra time doing the offline work and then putting it together, you got human error, you have extra resources and time going in, and it limits that. Exactly. Hopefully increases the productivity of the entire company working together. Absolutely. So that's, that's definitely a cool part of it. Now, yes. but I think it even goes deeper than that because from us now, when we look at social media, mm -hmm. So brand perspective gets built into ERPs, or we believe it should be built into ERPs. But from a social media perspective, the reason that we like it as part of the system, and often when companies don't implement it, it still drains resources because we can't get posts through compliance fast enough. Okay. 
So in a lot of organizations, in larger organizations, we find that those posts will go through multiple layers of hierarchy, mm -hmm. go through compliance, go through lawyer process, go through everything, all of a sudden ready to go. Again, this is in bigger companies, ones that mm -hmm. want to make sure everything's together before they post because of risk mitigation, but it just takes so long because it's not built as part of that system. Right. So looking at how that is going to be part of ERPs is a huge part of what we do now trying to figure out how it fits into every level so that content, whatever you're making, mm -hmm. can get approved faster. Yeah. And it's hard to do again because I think that a lot of the clients, when they're looking at it, they always put, they still are putting the content, the social content, the scary content, the content that they think there's a ton of risk with, yeah. last in comparison to some of those other traditional models of branding. But what they're doing then is they're burning resources on spending more money on that advertising, on that branding. Then they burn resources on compliance and actually getting any social post out or putting anything out online, whether it's a blog, whether it doesn't matter what it is. It goes through so many layers that it just ends up costing so much money. So building it into the entire system and finding a way to streamline that process is so vital because yeah. every single revision absolutely destroys the process and burns resources literally lights money on fire in a lot of cases yeah. and we we want to minimize that yeah now i am guessing that you haven't seen that type of erp in place in too many places yet in large organizations because it's just still not top of mind we're thinking finance accounting yeah crm and all of these items but then when it comes down to content allowing people to go into a media center and pull a video out to put in their presentation for a client they still can't do that. That's still a standalone system. Yeah. So bridging that gap and finding a way to align those media centers and the ERP, I think, is going to be an important part of the next decade. Yes. Um, but still tough. Yeah, it, it is really tough. But I think you're you're right on there with something. I think that these different types of media and these different types of social media um, do need to be considered in that larger kind of ERP environment. And what does that look like moving forward? I don't, I don't know how much of that conversation is happening at in terms of kind of a system level, yeah. you know, if there's those considerations out there, but it's the way that businesses are trending mm -hmm. and it's the way that, you know, the employees of those businesses are also, you know, trending. So, yeah. Does, uh, at, the, <laughs> at the large consulting level, does the social media presence come up or is it still lost at the bottom of the priority list in a lot of conversations? So in terms of like our own kind of social media presence? No, like within, just oh. with when you're going in for these systems, is anything from the branding standpoint coming up or is it still bottom of the conversation that we're on internal processes first? Yeah, so a lot of my experiences have been on the kind of the internal processes, mm -hmm. internal operations. Um, I think it's really, you know, it does kind of depend, I guess, on the organization that we are yep. working with. Um, there has been some conversations with people about kind of the experience with you know their customer and how they can make that better through you know different apps or things like that to kind of engage um, the customer yep. a little bit differently so I think the conversation is starting to get there um, but I know with my experiences it's been more kind of on the internal process internal operation side yeah so I think I think there's still there's the opportunity for that to become part of the conversation mm -hmm. and build that again even if it's not even if companies aren't willing to go to the content creation yet yeah if they just think about it from an internal aspect where that person does need that video for their presentation to a client or just anything with that, that last Christmas party you're sending out a letter to some of your colleagues yeah. and you can go in and you can find those photos in the media center just allowing that content to be available through the system I, it's going to make its way in. It's just a matter of time. Exactly. It's kind of not a not an if, but when. It's not an if, but when. Yeah. Um, talk about something else. Talk about a story or talk about something on a high level that you see in industry that you think is going to change. We're almost at 2020, so we're in a new decade. Mm -hmm. It's a fresh start, and a lot of people are going to look at it that way. We're going to have a lot of phone calls in January of people saying, you know what, it's time to make some sort of change. Yes. And they might not be sure what it is, but they're going to be ready to do something. So what do you see in 2020 and beyond that yeah. you're going to see in organizations? Yeah, that's, that's a really great question. I mean, um, I think the, a lot of the conversation that we are kind of seeing is around 
you know, machine learning mm -hmm. and AI, right? How can that yeah. be used by organizations to optimize processes, to get better data and analytics? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that we're going to see a real push towards, you know, some of those trends, especially kind of within the private sector. Yeah. Um, and then I think kind of on the public sector side, you know, generally they are a little bit behind the times when it comes to technology. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to see a really big push in public sector, you know, digital health and things like that, or even in kind of the post-secondary mm -hmm. um, area on getting them more, you know, modernized, more with the times. <laughs> okay, so you touched on something there that I want to touch on and okay. get your opinion on. You said going through the process that we're going to use AI, which I, that's coming. That's, that's, yes. a, that's an absolute yeah. when, yeah. um, for all organizations. And we implemented already on a lot of levels in marketing, just through the systems we use, just through the advertising that we do online. But you said something about there that caught my attention about analytics. Mm -hmm. So how can we get better data and how can we use that better data? Now, pet peeve of mine though, is that organizations, we give organizations all of the data. We even teach them how to use it. Yeah. And then they don't look at it. Yeah. They don't do anything with it. So from the organizational change perspective, how do you get the right data, but then also have the system in place to use it appropriately? Is that built into the system or is that something that each individual person has to get trained on when you're in those that large organizational 10,000 feet looking down? What do you think that's gonna look like? Because for myself, I still think that yes, there may be a process in place, Maybe you have that, that, that monthly meeting where everyone's in discussion and you're going through the data line by line and understanding what it is. But a lot of times it's still based on those leaders to go out and spend that time and actually use the data. Yeah. Yeah, I think we are seeing a trend towards um, organizations kind of empowering, you know, their employees to actually learn, mm -hmm. you know, how to use data and analytics. Um, I know some some things I've seen is actually sending kind of people for that training so that internally they can kind of be building the types of dashboards and they can do the coding or yeah. all those types of things to actually run the reports that they need kind of internally for mm -hmm. themselves. So really trying to empower their employees to get to that that stage. Um, I know, you know, we have supported some clients in terms of building kind of dashboards, mm -hmm. you know, for them that they can utilize. To get their KPIs, yes. but if you're in procurement, <laughs> you're getting KPIs of your lead time and your products, and you can go through every level and get your KPIs. Yeah. Um, but yeah. are they using it still? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really, it's dependent. You know, I, I think that we've been fortunate um, to see that there's a lot of interest at mm -hmm. that employee level to kind of gain those insights and be able to take the lead on learning how to get to that point. Um, so I think there's a trend for people wanting to learn. I think it's just a matter of actually putting in the effort you know, to learn how to get those insights and use data analytics in the right way. And so I think that's something that we are gonna see you know, moving forward. It might not be as Instant. quick, yeah. um, but I think it's there. I think people are interested. And I think that as different types of software kind of progresses and maybe makes it easier at kind of a beginner level to to gain those insights, you're gonna see more of it, mm. you know? And uh, I, know, I know for me, like myself, I don't actually do a lot of work with data analytics, um, data and analytics myself yeah. or machine learning. I'm interested in learning, yeah. right? Um, but I think if it got to the point where maybe it was a bit easier to learn, I'd be more on board. So, so. maybe that's, for someone listening, they're going to go out and they're going to create a data analytics online course that everyone yeah. can take. I still think, though, that the discussion has to be had of, okay, we need AI, we need to learn more, we need more data, mm -hmm. but then let's actually use the data appropriately yeah. rather than just having the data. Because just having the data yeah. doesn't do a lot for companies that are just sitting there on that data and not using it. Yeah. So you, and, and that comes back to everything. Like, I... I I push at our level and kind of that, like I said, the 200 employee and under companies yeah. to streamline those processes, make them as efficient as possible so yeah. that you stop burning resources. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if you're doing something for the brand, creating an advertisement, going through the data, utilize it, create and correct as much as possible. 
I call it create and correct because I just think it's it's a better term than yeah. trial and error. But <laughs> yeah. you use you use everything you do. You yeah. start creating all of your your content or creating your internal processes, and then as soon as you have that data, you correct yeah. and you make changes so that yeah. you can go forward. Um, making that part of the culture of a company though is is I think the hardest part. Yes. Because mm -hmm. you can put everything in place, but yeah. if you can't get people up to where they feel like they're closer to the end game than at the beginning, at the starting point. Yeah. To prevent them from going back to where they started is tough. And I think that's something that's why there's so many books written on it. That's why there's so much out there is because we're trying to figure out still how to make people work better together and stop kind of that oscillation that happens in basically every organization in the world. Yeah. So. Do you want to touch on, do you have any questions for me, first of all? Because sometimes I, I just talk and I take <laughs> over everything. Do you have any questions for me? You know what? Um, not right now. Okay. I'll think about something. All right. Anything ever comes <laughs> up, Brianna's going to send me an email and I'm going to answer it on a piece of content. Um, okay. So last thing then, let's talk about that culture change. And in 2020, cultures are going to change. We're starting to see in a lot of organizations, larger ones, a changing of the guard. Um, younger people that have grown up with, with digital mm -hmm. in all levels, whether just grown up with websites, grown up with phones, can, can using every single app or know what TikTok is, those people are coming into organizational leadership positions. And, and there's still a clash between some of the old guard that have always done it one way and this new generation coming through. I'm not just saying millennials, I'm just yeah. saying people that have grown up with technology and understand it fully. So in 2020 to 2030, we're going to see more of that. We're going to see more of organizations trying to figure that out. Um, what have you seen so far? Yeah, I mean, I've seen some some pretty cool things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of going back to what I was saying about the AI and machine learning, there's definitely organizations that, you know, have kind of the right people in place that are really pushing forward on those types of things, which is really cool to see. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we do still have, though, a lot of organizations that they love their pen and paper. Mm -hmm. They love their manual data entry, and that's how they, they want to stay. But unfortunately, I think just, you know, to be able to grow kind of business performance, it's inevitable to see that transition to digital yeah. in, in some form or another. And uh, so there's... There is some pushback, you know, in, in certain industries and certain types of companies, certain types of cultures. Yep. And, uh, but I have seen, you know, and I know generational kind of conversations are, are a big topic. Um, and we're really seeing that push from maybe some of the younger generations for more digital. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, some companies have seen the, the negative effects of not becoming more digital and actually losing, you know, well, talent in that workforce. Yeah, you lose, yeah. You not, but not only do you lose talent in the workforce, yeah. there's someone else that's doing it more efficiently that you've now opened the door yeah. to take over your market share and whatever you do. And that's the same, I mean, when, when we talk about that in a disruption space, yeah. online has given the ability for companies to come in and disrupt industries very quickly. Yes. And I mean, look at the accounting space for a lot of people. That was actually, a lot of people don't talk about it, but QuickBooks was the disruptor in the accounting space yeah. that nobody talks about in terms of absolutely disrupting an industry because it was one of the first yeah. that came out. It's QuickBooks has been out for a while. Mm -hmm. It absolutely disrupted all accounting spaces across Canada, across the US. Yeah. And it's not the blockbuster, it's not the, it's not the ones that get the attention, but mm -hmm. there's room in all industries for digital and companies that become more efficient using digital and AI to disrupt other industries. And if you fall too far behind, you end up having to spend way too much money to catch up mm -hmm. and it's too late. Yeah. Oh, and absolutely. we're going to see a lot more of that in the next decade, a lot more companies falling behind and not being able to catch up. Yeah. Uh, and now I think it's up to the leaders of these organizations to, to implement that change in a way that is usable where yeah. they can use the data, and then continue continue to succeed and continue to grow. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you, you see, you know, kind of top of mind for 
um, industry disruption and digital disruption is you look at kind of banking and fintech, yeah. right? That's a huge one. And, and I think that that's something that you're going to see more of these fintech mm-hmm. kind of companies coming up. And Because it's, it's, we all do it online now. <laughs> Absolutely. So you can easily not yeah. have a single location, not a single location and handle everything online. Oh, yeah. So that Amazing. disruption is coming. It is. And it's, it's, I think it's coming pretty quick. Mm-hmm. You know, so it'll be interesting to see kind of, you know, some banks are starting to kind of trend, you know, towards making investments, you know, for digital transformations. Yep. And you're starting to see that. So it'll be interesting to see kind of how quickly they can kind of get themselves to that point. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, but that, that, yeah. that market share will split very quickly. Yes. And then every single company will be operating with less resources and all trying to catch up to the same space. Yeah. And that's the most amazing part about our new digital world. It's not just online, but digital itself yeah. is because you have the opportunity to scale anything. Now it's just a matter of executing it, yeah. which you can have all the ideas in the world. You're still going to have to execute. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Brianna. Yes, this thank was you. awesome. Yeah. Great conversation. Thanks for coming out early on a Friday morning. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Stay Friday? No, it's Wednesday. Wednesday, so I'm not even on the right day of the week. Thanks for coming out on a Wednesday morning. This was a lot of fun. And um, any questions you ever have, just let me know. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks.